Okay, um, well, first off, just like to say thank you uh, to everyone um, on the call today for allowing me to come and, and share a bit of perspective from, from our organization and myself personally. Uh, so my name is Steve Elliott, uh, Director of Gas Business Development within Enbridge's gas transmission team uh, based out of Calgary. You know, and I think we've heard some great perspective on what hydrogen is and, you know, the blue sky view of what the future could hold. I've been asked to share uh, some thinking on hydrogen as it relates to existing natural gas infrastructure. And before I do that, I thought I'd take a few minutes to set the stage um, as we see it. So it's, it seems increasingly likely, as we've heard from the other presenters today, that hydrogen is going to play a role in the future energy mix globally. Um, how large a role low carbon hydrogen will play in Canada and North America more broadly, I think, remains to be seen. Uh, but quite clearly, uh, it's going to need help um, through government policy to achieve the future that we all envision. What's interesting, though, is that even if policy here takes time to develop, um, real strategy and real dollars are being committed in other jurisdictions. This is going to drive down the cost of producing and, and transporting hydrogen and spur demand growth. Uh, Simon mentioned a few jurisdictions like Germany committing $9 billion. A few weeks back, Japan added $19 billion to support uh, ecologically focused businesses as well. So huge momentum, not only for hydrogen, but for all uh, GHG abatement and uh, climate um, businesses. So this said, I think with, again, this is our view, with supporting policy in place, um, Western Canada is well positioned to take advantage of the opportunity, both domestically and globally. Uh, you know, we've heard and we all know about the mature natural gas industry that we've got. Um, in Alberta, we have established carbon capture and storage infrastructure and expertise. Uh, in BC, of course, we have um, direct air capture experience and expertise that's been mentioned. We have attractive renewable resources in both provinces and we have skilled workforce. We think though that a uh, it's gonna require cooperation and coordination amongst a variety of stakeholders to realize full potential. So I'm talking about academia, industry, communities and government, both here and abroad. So just a few seconds on Enbridge. I know most people are probably familiar and I'm not gonna do a big sales pitch, um, but we are North America's largest infrastructure company. And you know, as a company, we've spent the last few decades positioning our, our organization for the future. We've been aligning our asset mix with shifting fundamentals. We started uh, decades and decades ago as a, as a crude oil business with our liquids pipeline system. Uh, but since 2002, we've invested $9 billion in renewables, both in North America and overseas in the EU. Um, and of course, we had a, a major acquisition in, in Spectra Energy, which uh, increased and enhanced our natural gas business back in 2016. Um, we have been recognized as the leader uh, in ESG performance for our sector, and we're going to continue to drive improvement in this space over time. We've also recently announced uh, ambitious climate goals. Uh, we're committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050 and reducing the intensity of our business uh, by 2030. And in our minds, we see four key ways to achieving these emissions targets and they're already in our plan. Uh, so very quickly, they're modernizing our assets, you know, so that's replacing old infrastructure, old compression, for example, on our natural gas system with new compression. Uh, self power initiatives, we recently um, implemented a solar generation facility adjacent to one of our uh, compressor stations in New Jersey. Nature-based solutions, which we talked about earlier here as a group and offsets. And then finally, decarbonizing the grid. And on the decarbonization pathway, uh, there's kind of four key areas we're focused on as an organization. Uh, and I'll touch on them briefly um, and spend a little bit more time on hydrogen. So we're participating today in about half dozen RNG projects. Um, hydrogen, isn't, hydrogen isn't new to us. Simon did mention the Markham Power to Gas facility in his presentation. That's uh, an Enbridge facility. Um, and we've been operating that uh, two and a half megawatt facility since 2018. It was actually the first utility scale electrolyzer to be commissioned in North America. Um, and, and what's exciting for us and germane to the conversation today is that in November, uh, the regulator in Ontario, the Ontario Energy uh, Board, approved a project that we'd submitted to connect this power to gas facility to a portion of our gas grid in the local Markham community. So for 
uh, sorry, by this time next year, uh, we will be blending 2% hydrogen by volume to 3,600 homes. Again, this will be a North American first. And I know 2% doesn't sound like a lot. And we do think that ultimately we can blend to a higher percentage than that. But we want to start small and gain real world experience and see how this impacts not only our system, uh, but also the experience of our, our users in Markham before implementing a higher percent. Um, also, just today, actually, we announced through our Gaza Fier subsidiary, which is a Quebec utility, uh, that we're going to be collaborating with Brookfield Renewable Partners on the development and use of green hydrogen in Quebec. So very focused, particularly on our utility business around um, hydrogen and its potential. And we do see opportunity for more widespread infrastructure investment over time, uh, both in new development. So Simon and Rob both mentioned uh, new hydrogen specific pipelines, but also in further blending, including in parts of our uh, existing uh, high pressure, large diameter transmission system. That said, we're gonna be very disciplined and measured in our approach to introducing hydrogen into any of our pipelines. Um, so for us today on the transmission side, outside of building relationships with stakeholders, potential partners, and advocate, advocating for policy uh, with government, our current focus is evaluating the technical feasibility of blending. So really for us, this is assessing the integrity, safety, and operational concerns and capabilities, as well as identifying potential candidates for blending within our transmission asset franchise. Uh, I think Rob mentioned it, and, and, and it's very true. When it comes to blending hydrogen existing infrastructure today, the body of research globally is lacking, and particularly so when you're talking about the high-pressure transmission networks around the world. Certain, certain countries are certainly more advanced than North America in thinking about this, but not a lot of work has been done and very little real-world experience on high-pressure systems exist. So although we as a company believe that existing gas systems will play an important role in transmission and distribution of hydrogen, it's still early days. Um, the safety and integrity of our systems obviously paramount to what we do. And these gaps in understanding in our minds must be addressed before considering the acceptance of hydrogen. I think it's also important to note that the amount of hydrogen that ultimately can, can be blended is gonna vary significantly between pipeline systems and has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Robin mentioned, you know, folks looking at 20 or 30%. Certainly true, we've read those uh, press releases as well. And we may get there um, as an organization, certain parts of our network, but I think it really does depend on um, the vintage of the pipe and, and the equipment associated to it. So when we think about what needs to be done, I, in other words, what's missing from this body of research, there are multiple categories that need to be further investigated. And they're both technical and non-technical in nature. Um, I'll go through these quickly because I want to make sure we have time for, for questions. But on the integrity side, you know, steel pipes and components are susceptible to embrittlement from hydrogen. Uh, so the specific gr grade of steel that's used, the types of welds, and unique equipment to that system are going to contribute to integrity concerns and considerations. Um, other metals in instrumentation, valves, gaskets, uh, may also be affected and impacted differently, and those are going to need to be assessed. The gas stream itself will have an impact. So impurities in the gas, like oxygen or hydrogen sulfide, de deposits on the pipeline, uh, whether it's scale or sand, um, water or other liquids in the, in the gas, um, gas stream itself, can impede or accelerate uh, hydrogen entry into steel. So again, something that needs to be looked at. And then finally, operational factors like the pressure at which the pipeline operates, fluctuations in that pressure, differences in temperature are also going to have to be studied. From a safety perspective, um, we did touch earlier on some of the unique characteristics of hydrogen as compared to natural gas. So these need to be studied to ensure this, the safety of the public and our employees. Um, these different characteristics also lead to questions of compatibility. So for example, in existing compressors, uh, how will existing combustion systems react given differences in flame speed? Hydrogen moves faster than natural gas does. Flame temperature, it burns hotter. Um, and then stability differences in the gas mix, particularly in blends. And what happens if the blend ratio changes? All important questions. On the non-technical side, uh, obviously a lot of outreach needs to happen to understand community concerns, 
um, educate the public on hydrogen's use and the differences between it and natural gas, um, if it, that's the fuel or energy it's looking to replace. Um, there are gaps in existing standards and regulations when it comes to hydrogen. Uh, you know, a lot of work has been done on pure hydrogen streams. Uh, we, we mentioned the existing pipelines that exist uh, today in Alberta and other parts of the world. The, the U.S. Gulf Coast has thousands of miles of pipe. Um, and they're governed by, by standards, but they're specific to pure hydrogen systems, not blended natural gas systems. Uh, and then as important, perhaps more important is that when we get into a transmission system in particular, um, you know, that transmission system feeds not only one customer, but many customers, in some cases, thousands of customers. You know, for example, our West Coast system, it's directly connected to Fortis and Pacific Northern Gas, but it's also connected to uh, Northwest Pipeline at the border. So conceivably blended gas could end up uh, from our West Coast system as far as California. So there's a bunch of impacts that need to be understood and communicated to make sure that uh, we're not unduly uh, harming anyone and their, and their use of gas. You know, and I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, Tyler from Fortis wasn't here to, to join us today, but on the distribution side of the grid, I think this concern is even amplified, right? Uh, you've got home appliances like cooktops and fireplaces, and then you've got industrial processes um, and those industrial processes like, for example, steel making or glass making that rely on high heat those processes are going to be very sensitive to gas quality and tolerances for hydrogen might be extremely low, which would limit how far up on the blending side you could actually introduce hydrogen. Um, we've heard a lot about economics of hydrogen. We haven't really heard a comparator to natural gas yet. Uh, so I'll just throw this out there. We, we took a look at the um, delivered uh, price of natural gas, not the cost to produce natural gas, but the price of natural gas in the lower mainland of British Columbia earlier this year, it was about seven bucks a GJ. Uh, that translates to about 75 cents or so of um, per kilogram. So when we talk about hydrogen costing, not the price of, but the cost of, um, two bucks um, at the source, at best case with, with blue hydrogen, we've got a significant gap in price that needs to be addressed, right? So you know, we'll need to understand what the impact of that higher price energy molecule is on existing end use applications. And really that's to say that we believe things like policy, whether it's carbon pricing or other, other ways, uh, will be required to incent fuel switching. Um, you know, closer to home, obviously the study around integrity and safety is gonna identify infrastructure modifications on existing systems. We need to understand what those are, how much they'll cost, and how we'll toll to account for them. I mean, hydrogen, as has been mentioned, has significantly uh, less energy by unit of volume. So there's going to be impacts to existing pipelines that need to be considered. So there's a lot of work to be done quite clearly. Um, you know, and I don't think in my mind or in our organization's mind, any of this is insurmountable, uh, but it's gonna take time and funding to close these gaps in knowledge. So as a company, we've already started down this path. Uh, Harvey mentioned uh, working with, with Fortis on understanding the West Coast system. So we have prepared the scope of study to understand the potential for hydrogen in that system. Um, we're still in the process of finalizing funding. Once we've got that funded and once we kick it off, it's an 18 to 24 month process to get to the end point or the conclusion uh, of just understanding what it's gonna take. And then of course, we'd actually have to do the work. So uh, the point being, I think there, we're, we're time and money away from, from really implementing blending in an existing system. Um, other things we're doing more globally within our franchise, uh, there's a lot of um, nonprofit research uh, labs out there in North America. We are part of a consortium of industry and academia that's supporting uh, one in particular, the National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, they're gonna be, um, doing a, a broader study on transmission and distribution capabilities in relation to blending, uh, among other things like end use uh, impacts and considerations. And, and that study was actually awarded funding not only by this consortium of, of industry and academia, but by the US Department of Energy. So uh, a lot of work underway and I'm very confident that you know, a year or two years from now, we're gonna be a lot further along in our understanding of hydrogen's potential in existing gas grids. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done today. 
Um, and with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause and I've spoken a lot, so happy to take any questions you might have. <laughs>